Okay, and we're live. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for another MSU Science Festival afternoon science snack. I'm Catherine with the MSU Science Festival. I'm joined by Roxanne Troon as well from the Science Festival. And today we're also joined by Dr. Abby Stevens, a postdoc at MSU in the astronomy department. Hi, Abby. Welcome. Hello, thank you. Um, I, uh, yeah, I'm a postdoc in the astronomy department. My funding comes from the National Science Foundation and I research really extreme stuff in space. So uh, black holes and neutron stars and the really strong gravity that's around them. They make physics behave in really strange ways and I want to learn more about that. And um, in part of that, shall I start? Okay. And um, so as part of my science, I use telescopes that are in space. And I wanted to talk with you all more broadly about all the kinds of science that's happening in space right now over our heads. So it's titled Science in Space. We're first gonna go over a little bit of background about what else has been in space before, namely um, crewed space stations. The first crewed orbital space station was launched by Russia in 1971, and it was called the Salyut 1 mission. Um, it was only up for maybe a few, a few days to weeks before it came back down. It was just like a test of how it would go, but it was a successful first test. Salyut 2 then uh, didn't work out very well. Um, it was only up for a matter of days and there weren't any crew on board as far as we know, but it was also a military operation. So a lot of the details of it were kept quiet until quite recently. Then Russia launched uh, the Salyut missions three, four, five, six, and seven. Three was mostly successful. They had one out of two crews that were up there. Uh, four and five were very successful, but these were still short term stays where they were up there for, a mat for at most a few weeks. So usually a couple of days up to maybe a few weeks. But for Salyut 6 and 7, which were launched in the um, early to mid uh, 1980s, these ones had some longer duration crews in addition to short duration crews. So they had um, crews stay on board for up to three months. Ni and as of 1986, the longest any human being had ever been in space all, all at one given time was 96 days. So this was a really, really long time to be up in space back then in the 80s. After the success of the Salyut missions, um, the first few, uh, the US and NASA launched Skylab. This was in partnership with some uh, European uh, collaborators. And Skylab was launched in 1973. So this was around about the Salyut 3 mission timeline. Um, Skylab, as we said, was open to international partners. So there were people of many different countries that were on board Skylab. And it was up for six years in total. We did a lot of interesting space and this was the US's first time to ever try doing science in space. MER was then the follow-up to the Salyut missions from Russia. And this was up from 1986 until 2001. 2001 is pretty recent actually. So some of you might even have been born then. Um, and MER was the follow-up uh, for the Salyut mission. So Russia was able to continue doing science in space. After that, um, towards the end of MER, the International Space Station was launched. It was launched in 1998, uh, and it's still up and happening right now, and there's still plans to continue it going. Um, here we have a picture of the International Space Station, and we're gonna talk in more detail about all the stuff on the space station. But it's not the only thing in space right now. Uh, from 2011 to 2018, China had the Tiangong-1 uh, experiment and then they uh, that was kind of their, their like test case because it was China's first time ever going into space as you see from above it took Russia and the US quite a few tries until they got something stable up in space to do their science and so China's second attempt Tiangong 2 was launched in 2016 and it is still housing long-term Chinese space crews up there so there's two space stations in orbit above the earth right now when we talk about how far up is it, this is a picture that's showing us all of the different heights that you can be above the Earth in its orbit. So we have the 
Oh, my mouse is invisible. That's cool. Um, so we have the Earth right there. And then there's these smaller lines that are right around the Earth. And you see the ISS. I've pointed to it, a big arrow to it in pink. So there's a very skinny pink line close to the Earth. And that's where the International Space Station is orbiting. We call this low Earth orbit because even though it's high up compared to Earth, it's quite low compared to all the other things that are orbiting around the Earth. Um, there are some other things that are labeled there. The iridium satellites are whenever you see like a falling star, a lot of those are um, an iridium flare where you have a satellite catching a glint of the sun as it's starting to come into the Earth's shadow. Then we have some other satellites listed that are farther up on the top that are GPS uh, satellites. This is what allows the maps to work on your phone when you're driving or walking somewhere. And then the farthest thing is a geostationary Earth orbit. So this means that when something is that far away from the Earth and it's orbiting around the Earth, it can stay above the exact same spot on the Earth the whole time. But so this 250 miles up, this, this is pretty far up because it's in space, right? It's not on the Earth. But if we were to drive 250 miles uh, sideways, either north or south or east or west, we see that it, it gets you kind of far, but it's not actually that far away. So if you were to drive from Lansing north 250 miles, you'd get to the Canadian border at Sault Ste. Marie. Or if you could somehow uh, drive across the lake, you could get out to about Madison, Wisconsin, or down to Cincinnati, or a bit past Chicago, or almost to Pittsburgh. So 250 miles, it is pretty far when you go up, but it's not actually that far when you go north, south, east, or west. So this is how far it is if you were to just get in your car and somehow turn it up on its side and drive straight up into the sky. That's how far it would be. But when things are in space, they are weightless, but they're not floating. They're actually all in free fall. So if you've ever jumped off of a really high diving board or something, or if you've ever done um, some kind of bungee at like an indoor sports uh, facility, um, you might have felt this little feeling in your belly when it's a really big jump where your belly kind of floats a little bit. This is where um, you are entering free fall, which is this velocity that things will just fall at uh, when they're around the earth. So in this gift that I have here, this is a astronaut uh, Mark Kelly and um, he the the astronaut and the spaceship that's all around him and the carrot are all falling together at the same speed so none of, none of it is floating but it's all falling around the earth together at about the same speed and so as you see in this gif he's able to pop a baby carrot out of his mouth and it appears to float across uh, until he can uh, catch it in his mouth and eat it. So scientists call this weightlessness microgravity. It's not zero gravity because there's actually all the gravity. You're falling with gravity the whole time. But we call it microgravity because they get to study changes in free fall with just little tiny deviations from free fall gravity. So we like to say that science in space is happening in a microgravity environment. The International Space Station is pretty big when you think of it compared to a person, but not that big when you think of it compared to other stuff people have built. So it's about the size uh, of a football field. Here we have if uh, NASA were to have a home stadium, this is what it would look like. And these really big black things coming out of the ends uh, on the top and bottom are the solar panels. And this is what gives the International Space Station all of its power for all of the electricity to keep the astronauts happy and to keep all the science experiments going. And then in the middle, you see all these different modules and these little kind of blocks on top of things. And the module, the big tubular modules are where the astronauts are housed. So they have different modules. It's like a room, but in space. So it's small and it's a tube and they call it a module. So there's different modules for them to sleep and for them to eat and for them to exercise and for them to do science. And then these blocks that are attached on the outside of the space station is where a lot of science experiments are housed. And we also see, I think there is a, um, a uh, spacecraft that's docked on um, at the top with the little black X. Those are the, I think that's from a uh, space uh, shuttle that's docked there. So on the International Space Station, this is a real picture of it that was taken um, by one of the uh, cargo 
um, space flights as it was leaving. On the International Space Station, there's a huge range of science that's happening over our heads right now. We, we can study astronomy and physics. We can do atmospheric and space science. We can also do technology stuff. We can look at biology and chemistry and also start to look at medicine and psychology of the astronauts themselves that are on board. So right now in space above our heads are 212 experiments happening. Now, most of these experiments happen on their own. They don't need the astronauts to do anything for them because that would keep the astronauts really extra busy. Um, but the astronauts do contribute to a lot of cool things happening inside the modules on the space station. So in terms of medicine, some of the different things that they're studying are uh, the blood pressure and heart rate of the astronauts. They get their vital signs checked every single day. So that way the doctors on the ground can monitor how the astronauts are doing over the course of their um, term up on the space station. Um, there is radiation exposure in space. When we're down on the surface of the earth, uh, there is a mag big magnetic field that's invisible that surrounds the entire earth. And that plus the atmosphere of the earth protect us from a lot of really high energy uh, particles that are flying through space. But when you get above the atmosphere, um, the, the atmosphere doesn't protect you anymore and so there's radiation exposure. So this exposure goes up and it can be damaging to human bodies, but I was reading that the astronauts are now trying out these new radiation blocking vests that they're wearing and they want to be sure that these vests are comfortable so that way they're inspired to keep them on the whole time because if it's not comfortable and it's blocky, they won't want to keep them on and then it's not very useful. When they look at the bone density of astronauts measured on Earth before they launch and on Earth when they come back down, the density of their bones decreases. It turns out that having the gravity of the Earth compressing your bones helps them to stay dense and strong. And so when you no longer have uh, any gravity really pressing down on you against something else, because they appear to float inside of the space station, the density of their bones go down and it's it's causing osteoporosis and preliminary osteoporosis at much earlier ages than they would have expected. There's also inside of your heads, you've got your brain, but surrounding your brain and your skull and inside your skull, you've got this fluid on your brain and that helps to cushion your brain so that way it doesn't get bonked if you hit your head. Well, there's with this fluid, it moves around extra when you're in space because this fluid is also in free fall inside of your skull as you are in free fall inside of the space station. And so they're trying to study uh, how does this move around and does it impact uh, the brain function of the astronauts. There's also fluid, so like liquid inside of our eyeballs. And this is what helps us to see colors. And this fluid moves around and it can have a weird effects on your optic nerve, which is what tells your brain what you're seeing. And it can make your eyeball shape change a little bit. So it can cause astronauts to have to wear glasses when they get back down to earth if they didn't need them beforehand. They were also doing an experiment on hearing because even though there's no sound out in space because there's no air, there is air inside the space station because the astronauts have to breathe. And so there's a lot of ambient loud sounds. Like if you are used to thinking of an air conditioner and a lawnmower, those kinds of loud ambient sounds are constantly around them the entire time. And so um, they're doing studies of how this long-term exposure to loud ambient sounds affects your overall hearing when you're no longer exposed to it. They can also do studies about circadian rhythms. This is uh, your body's natural rhythm for usually waking up at sunrise and going to bed at sunset. But on the space station, it goes around um, one, it, it, it has kind of one day every 90 minutes, every hour and a half. So it has 16 sunrises and sunsets every 24 hours. So the astronauts stick to like an earth day morning and night of going to bed and waking up but they experience a lot more sunsets and sunrises than that. So the uh, biologists and uh, doctors get to study how experiencing all these sunrises and sunsets affects the circadian rhythm of the astronauts because they're not going to bed when the sun sets. They're going to bed when the sun sets maybe the fifth time. And also they can get to study their muscles. Uh, when you don't use your muscles, they start to go away and they don't get as strong. So the astronauts have a workout regimen that they do every day to keep their muscles nice and strong. And they want to study how muscles develop when you're exercising in microgravity in space. There's a cool video I'm going to show you once, once I push start, push of this astronaut on a treadmill.
great run. Not quite the same as being out in the fresh air with the wind in your face. So you can see that as she runs on the treadmill, she has to be strapped to a harness and a bungee system so that she doesn't float away from the treadmill. Because if she were to normally step off of the treadmill to run, she would kick herself up to the ceiling of the space module. And then it's hard to run on a treadmill when you keep bouncing all around the room. So they have to do these interesting little twerks to it or tweaks to it. When, um, when they study uh, physics and chemistry, there's a bunch of cool stuff they can look at, such as fluid dynamics or how liquids move. We're going to see a video of that on the next slide. Um, liquids normally kind of roll around on whatever surface they're on, and if you put them on a slope, they move with gravity. But if they're free falling along with stuff, they can glob together in really funny ways. They can also look at what temperature water boils at. Uh, we know that water boils at 100 degrees Celsius or 212 degrees Fahrenheit but um, that's at sea level. And so if you were to go to the top of a really tall mountain in the Rockies, for example, or in the Himalayas, water boils at a lower temperature. It can boil at like 80 something or 90 something degrees Celsius. So when you're all the way up in space, it's not that water instantly boils off right away, but how can they measure what temperature water boils at? And what does that mean about what water does in microgravity? And this is, and they don't just look at water, but they look at other liquids as well. Scientists are trying to grow crystal structures. If they're trying to make um, electronics in space, they use crystalline structures to build the basic of the, the basic blocks of the electronics. They also burn stuff. Uh, as you can see with this flame, it doesn't have its usual um, like pointy tip on the top. Uh, it turns out that um, that's something that we just don't see when you burn stuff um, up in outer space. And they're also looking at having gecko-inspired robot adhesive. That's a picture of a gecko lizard at the bottom. And geckos have this really, really interesting way of staying on surfaces. So they can even stay on totally wet surfaces that are vertically or even upside down, and they don't fall because their toes do use this extra physics called van der Waals interactions to stay attached to it. So scientists are finally able to replicate what the geckos have been doing this whole time to have a way to keep robots firmly attached to the outside of space stations. They're also looking at how robots can hop or flip themselves from one point on the space station outside to the other side so that they can move without having to have liquid propellant on board. Hi, this is Scott Kelly aboard the International Space Station. I wanted to uh, do a little demonstration of these paddles. They're called hydrophobic paddles and they, uh, they repel water kind of like a raincoat. But, uh, but up here on the space station they allow you to uh, play ping pong with, with a ball of water and uh, it's pretty cool. So I think before with the baby carrot, I said it was Mark Kelly, but it was Scott Kelly. Um, Scott Kelly was the was the astronaut who spent a whole year in space, and his identical twin, Mark Kelly, stayed on the ground, who was also an astronaut, so that they could measure how uh, the twin bodies changed when one was exposed to microgravity for a long time and the other one wasn't. But so you saw that when they had the water, it globs to itself together, and it can almost make like a ping pong ball. And that's weird, because if you tried to squirt a water bottle outside here on the Earth, it wouldn't stay hovering in the air. It would fall to the ground. When we do astronomy on the International Space Station, we have a cosmic ray telescopes that can try to see exploding stars and see these really energetic particles coming from exploding stars. There are also cosmic ray detectors that aren't pointing but are just looking in general for evidence of the invisible dark matter that we think makes up about 20% of all the mass in the whole universe, uh, which is about five times um, as much stuff as, as what we can see in the universe. There's also an, uh, there's X-ray telescopes that observe neutron stars and black holes and other stuff that's bright in the X-rays. Uh, one is called Maxi, that's Japanese-led, and the other one is 
NICER, which there's a picture of down below here, I'm a part of the NICER science team. And so I use this telescope almost every day to look at cool black holes and neutron stars that are shining really brightly so that we can learn more about this weird, uh, really strong gravity and how it affects stuff that's orbiting close to black holes and neutron stars. Also, one of the uh, applications of NICER is to use pulsars, which are a type of neutron star that shine really brightly in these very precise pulses, almost like a clock, to use those to navigate like a solar system-wide GPS. GPS only works on Earth because we have those GPS satellites that are constantly orbiting the Earth. So as soon as you leave the GPS satellite orbit, you can't use GPS to tell where you are anymore but it's really important to know where you are when you're flying around in space. So for future missions to other planets, they're hoping to use these pulsars to tell where they are and how far to go. They're also using very fancy uh, binoculars uh, to fly that they're testing before they would fly in very little satellites called CubeSats, which are pretty small satellites. They're only maybe a foot or two big and they can fly lots and lots of them. And these fancy binoculars would be able to look back down at Earth and it would be an inexpensive way with many, many of them to do continuous Earth observations. So that's a, a simulation of what they think it could look like to use pulsars to navigate to other planets. In terms of biology, they can do a ton of biology experiments and a bunch of these the astronauts are themselves involved in. So salmonella is a bacteria that um, you can get sick if you, um, it, it, it can make you quite sick if you uh, don't cook meat or eggs. Uh, thoroughly enough. And it turns out um, it's pretty easy to grow just in a dish in, um, in a lab where it's contained. Turns out it grows more robustly when in space. So that's something to keep an eye on for future missions. They're also growing uh, a whole variety of plants and bacteria. They're growing grapevine stems to see how if you have a woody stem and you cut it to then encourage it to grow further, uh, how does that work in the microgravity of space? Um, there's a type of cress, which is a common weed here on Earth, but it grows pretty well. And so they're using it uh, as kind of a pilot plant to see how that type of plant will grow in space. Uh, the E. coli bacteria is very common to grow in biology labs, um, and they're growing that up in, on the space station. And even cotton, because if we're going to have really long term, um, really long term like space flights, we're going to have to have some way to clothe all the people because eventually when you wear your shirts and pants for long enough, they start to get holes in them. There's also growing not just those plants, but tasty plants for food. They are growing radishes, cabbage, lettuce, pak choy, and mustard greens, mizuna, uh, up in space. So if you eat any of these um, plants uh, this week or next week, you are eating the exact same food that the astronauts are growing on the space station and eating probably right now. So that's really cool. You can grow these in your garden and the astronauts can grow them also on the space station. It's really important to grow tasty uh, 
plants that we want to eat. So uh, they want to know why herbs grown in space might smell and taste a bit differently. There are these molecules that are what make something smell the way it does. And those molecules seem to form a little differently when they're uh, developing out in, in the microgravity of the space station. But having food that's really tasty is important to get the astronauts to eat enough so that they have all their strength to do all of their exercising and all of their science experiments. So food fatigue is a real thing that they're studying psychologically um, because they don't want the astronauts to eat the same mushy oatmeal all day long because then they would get really bored of it and they wouldn't want to be astronauts and they wouldn't want to eat all of their meals. So by growing tasty things, this helps in in encourage them to eat all the vitamins that they need. In terms of atmospheric and space science, um, they can do aurora observations. These are the northern lights and the southern lights. Um, they can look at um, upper atmosphere lightning storms. So not all lightning comes to, all the way down to the ground. Some of it is just among the clouds in the upper atmosphere. They're looking at how space dust grains grow in size because the earth before it was a planet, it was just a whole bunch of dust grains that slowly grew and grew to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so it's not gonna form another earth. There aren't enough dust grains for that, but they want to know how dust grains can grow in size when it's up in space at the edge of the atmosphere. And they're also monitoring um, the atmosphere of the earth for clouds and aerosols and pollutants and hazes and gas concentrations and storms and all of these kinds of things. It's super, super important that we understand where these um, storms and what the different dynamics are so that way we can plan in case there's a big storm uh, coming our way, for example. Here's a video of the, interna of the, the International Space Station uh, looking at the aurora on Earth. So you can see that little thin bright band over the surface, that's the atmosphere. And the aurora tend to look green and purple from the Earth, but there's red at the very top of the atmosphere because the red color only happens when you have a very low density of oxygen. Luckily, we have a good density of oxygen on the surface, that's what we breathe. And then there's a solar panel and the sun. Oh, and a fun sound at the end with the ESA logo. So they get a bunch of cool videos of the aurora happening um, during at least some of their 16 sunrises and sunsets every day. Uh, for further reading, a bunch of astronauts have written books about their experience and about what they wish people would learn from their own experiences. So there's an astronaut's guide to life on earth by Chris Hadfield. There's Endurance, A Year in Space, A Lifetime of Discoveries by Scott Kelly. There's Chasing Space by Leland Melvin. Uh, he's famous for having his official NASA picture with his two uh, big yellow labs next to him. Uh, there's a book, Packing for Mars by Mary Roach. She's a nonfiction author who I find very hilarious when I read her stuff. And she's writing about what it would take to have a long-term human mission to Mars. There's also a podcast episode that I really liked um, about the dark side of the earth. And uh, YouTube has a bunch of really great videos um, from NASA, from the Canadian Space Agency and the European Space Agency. Um, and that's all, thank you very much. Great, thanks Abby. Um, just as a reminder to everybody tuning in, um, feel free to type out your questions for Abby in the comment section. We'll be sure to answer them during the live stream here. Um, so Abby, while you know we wait for questions to come in, would you mind talking a little bit about your background and how um, you got to where you are, what inspired you to start studying astronomy? Yeah, um, so I didn't actually like math and science that much when I was in middle school and high school. I was able to do it, but it wasn't my favorite thing. I really liked theater and art classes. But I decided if I wanted to go into architecture and design, somebody said that you should take engineering classes in college if that's what you want to do. So I said, well, if I'm going to take engineering in college, I have to take math and physics in high school. So I took math and physics in high school. I ended up really, really liking it. And we did a unit for just like two months on astronomy. And when we did a unit on astronomy in my physics class, this is when we learned about the life cycle of stars and how like scientists still don't actually know all of the things that make a star explode in a supernova. Um, and I, this was the first time that I was introduced to the idea of scientific research being a job that you can have and do. Um, I thought that science had all kind of been done, at least in terms of physics, had all kind of been done, you know, 100 years ago, and it was all, all set. But it's not. There's tons and tons of stuff that we still don't know. There's a lot more that we don't know than there is that we do know, I would say. 
Um, and so getting to see the, 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 the curiosity of, um, of research really inspired me to keep going uh, with physics and astronomy. Awesome. So we had one comment uh, as you were talking about the different uh, space stations and people didn't realize that there are actually two space stations up there. Yeah. Yeah. Are, are they on either side of the earth or are they at the same height or? They're both at, um, oh, something went away. Just your screen share. There we go. Yeah. There you all are. Now I can see you. Um, the, yeah, so uh, Tiangong 2 only has Chinese um, astronauts on it. I'm not sure if anybody is on board right now, um, but I'm sure a quick um, search online would tell you that. Um, they, they're, they are both in low earth orbit, um, but low earth orbit, it looks small when you zoom out to look at the earth, if it's only this big, but it's a pretty spacious place. Like they're, they're not anywhere in any danger of coming too close to each other. Um, they are not like trailing right behind each other or right next to each other. They're just both in their own independent, um, orbits. But those astronauts also have 16 sunrise and sunsets every day, just at a different time than what the astronauts get on the space station. And is there any interaction between the two space stations? Do we work with the Chinese space station at all? Um, there's no direct interaction between them. Um, contrary to what you might see in movies, it is not possible to fly between two things in orbit. Um, so you can't, you know, go from uh, the International Space Station or from Hubble to Tiangong 2, that's just not possible. If you were to even get there, you would splat like a bug on a windshield when you got there, which is not what we are going for. <laughs> um, so yeah, so, so uh, there is a, a bit of science overlap. You know, scientists are communicating their results that they get and they publish them in open source journals, but that's about the extent of the um, collaboration between the two as far as I know. Okay, interesting. Um, how many people are in the, the ISS? Did you say that? And I might've missed it, but just curious right how now? many are up on the, our space station at any one time or the international space station? I think they can have up to five or six at any one time. Um, I'm not sure how many are on right now, but I can use the internet <laughs> and tell you, um, Oh, this is a big long list. I don't know how many are up there right now. Um, there's usually, so there's there's kind of always two or three at any given time. Um, that's the minimum number that they like to have on board. Um, but it's common to have a fairly full house, which is about five astronauts or so. Cool. And then I had a question on the pulse, using pulsars to navigate. Where yeah. Did I miss where the, how, how are our pulsars normally out there and we just use them as a tracking device or do we generate the pulsars? So pulsars are already out there. Um, for some of you watching on Facebook, you might have done a make your own pulsar event with me at a science festival last year or at the one the, with the classrooms that came to MSU this year, where we take the styrofoam ball and then we put the pipe cleaners around. Those are pulsars that we're making. And so these all exist out in the galaxy and in other galaxies. Um, they are left, they're what's formed when a, a like medium big star explodes in a supernova and then it can spin really fast still because if it gets much smaller, it can spin faster. Like when you're on your roller skates or ice skating and you have your arms out and then you pull your arms in, you spin faster. Stars kind of do the same thing. And um, if they're shining beams of light, then as they spin, we get a beep when the, when the light points towards us and then we don't see it when it points away from us. So there are um, probably tens of thousands of pulsars in the galaxy, I would say. We only know of 50-ish. Um, a lot of times we think they're there, they're just not pointing at us, um, which is not something that we can change at all. Um, but we know of something like 50 pulsars. Um, and so we can just track them. Right now we track them for science. We don't track them for navigation at all, but uh, the sextant mission, which was part of using the NICER telescope, was able to um, kind of prove as a proof of concept and an initial idea that this could happen. Because we, we've talked to, among ourselves that wouldn't it be cool if this could happen. And this was the first time that they actually tested the technology to show that it would work. That's exciting. Yeah. And Samantha had a question about minimum time an astronaut 
can be in space at any one time. Like what's the shortest amount of time they're in space? Yeah. I guess well, that's the question. Yeah. Yeah. So the shortest amount of time astronauts have been in space is not even going onto the space station, but is just being on some of the um, space shuttles that like uh, flew around like up into the atmosphere and then came back down, for example. Um, so the shortest time they are in space is for like at least a, at least like a few days, at least like two days or so. Um, it takes them a really long time to adjust to being in space. They're kind of like motion sick and seasick for a little while um, because your inner ear tells you which way is up and down. And when you're in free fall out in space, um, your inner ear is getting sloshed all around. And so you feel like you, you, it, it's very unnerving from what I've read. And so they, it takes them a bit of time to get situated with that. So they don't want to bring them back down before they've had the chance to do some real work. But now these days, the minimum, I, I would say they're up there for it definitely weeks, if not months at a time now. Um, about, a, I think, a year or a bit over a year is the longest we've had someone up there for now. They're not too keen on having people stay up for so, so long, just because, as we saw on the medicine slide, there are some detrimental effects to being up in space for too long. Um, and it's nice to give other people a chance to be up in space too. True, true. Awesome. Catherine, do you have any questions that you? I do. Um, I'm really curious. Um, what does it take to be an astronaut? What sort of training and background do a lot of these astronauts have? <laughs> so uh, these astronauts are, I would say, the most elite trained humans on earth, as far as I can tell. Um, they all have a very high technical degree. So this is typically a PhD in engineering or physics of some kind. They also all have extensive medical training and they have this before they go through astronaut school. So this is what they apply with already themselves. Um, they, they, uh, some of them are medical doctors, others are paramedics and EMT trained or firefighters. Like they all have emergency response and medical training. Um, the emergency response management is a really important skill when you're in space. Um, they also all have to have um, like aviation skills. So most, um, I don't know if most is the right word. A lot of astronauts have come through the Air Force and, and are fighter pilots um, because that can help show them how to navigate and how to make sense of, of their movements when they're up really, really far away from the earth. Um, it's also, it's a very technically challenging job and this is the kind of skills that they need for astronauts. Uh, they also have to be proficient in Russian because there are some, there's uh, astronauts of different uh, nationalities and languages on board the space station. And so I think a lot of things are still in English and Russian on the space station. Um, so it's helpful to at least be able to chat with your colleagues just a little bit, um, even if you're not gonna read a book from them. And um, yeah, it takes it uh, once someone is select. Oh, and they're also very physically fit. Like they are peak athletes, like it just extremely, extremely physically fit. Um, so it, once someone is selected, I think Chris Hadfield said it took 15 years of training after he was selected before he got to go to space. And that training is just rigorous practicing things over and over and over and over and practicing every iteration of what could go wrong so that way they know how to handle it so that way if something goes wrong they're like it's okay I practiced this 15 times I know what to do because keeping a cool head when there's big big emergencies around you is I think one of the most important parts of being an astronaut wow yeah probably it's not you know, for me but for some of our younger viewers there you go yeah <laughs> that's how yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. well I think we're running out of time um, we have a couple minutes left, so thank you so much, Abby, for Welcome. being on board for our science snack today. And I did post in our comments section, if you're out there listening, we have a survey we'd love you to take. Uh, let us know how we're doing and what you'd like to see in the future. And we have another science snack coming up in about 15 minutes on superbugs from the Michigan Department of Health. And then we have another series for the next couple of weeks on Wednesday. So stay tuned for that. And Catherine, do you have anything else you wanna add? Yeah, just, um, I did have one quick question. Um, one last question. I know there's a um, 
big historic event happening today, a yeah. partnership between NASA and SpaceX. Um, yeah. Could you talk a little bit about what, what that is, what's going on, why it's so important historically? So, um, so today there are, I think, two astronauts that are going to be launched in the SpaceX Dragon um, module um, to go up to the space station. And this is, I think, the first time that human beings will be carried in a private um, rocket. So SpaceX has delivered um, like food and technology. The nicer mission that I work on was delivered in kind of the trunk of one of the space station or in, in, uh, in one of the Dragon uh, rockets, or sorry, mm, Dragon, no, and just one of the SpaceX rockets, I think it was Falcon. Um, but this is the first time that astronauts are going to be flown um, in a SpaceX or any other private um, module. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is this is a retry. They've tried this quite a few times, and then conditions have not been good, so they've postponed it. So this has been postponed a whole bunch. But that's okay because space is really dangerous, and it can be really really tricky to get there. And so if it needs to take another month, that's okay. They'll take another month. They'd rather prioritize the health and safety of the astronauts. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, well, great. That's all I have. Um, thanks again, Abby. Yes, thank you both very much. <laughs> Bye.